Hello everyone and welcome to the first edition of Foreign Fridays and we are starting with City of God and for Foreign Fridays I will always have a live watch along in addition to a review so if you missed miss the watch along at least you can watch the review and so City of God is spectacular it aged incredibly well I was impressed by how well they weave everything in together and nothing is there Everything you see is there for a reason, you know? And honestly, this movie connects harder than Training Day. Like, every time you rewatch City of God, you will notice something different. And it's a testament to great filmmaking in addition to great storytelling. So loosely based on the novel by the same name, The City of God documents the growth of organized crime in one of the most notorious parts of Rio de Janeiro, City of God between 1960 and the beginning of the 80s by following two kids whose paths diverge, one becoming a photographer and the other a psychotic kingpin. The film starts in the middle of the action where we are introduced to the two kids all grown up with what looks like a tense standoff. Our main character Rocket is standing in the middle with a dilemma he must try to overcome if he is to survive. The, the, the dilemma being if you run away, they get you, and if you if they stay, if you stay, they get you. So essentially, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. The chicken at the start of the film. So in the beginning, the way the film is organized is that it kind of goes full circle, right? So the first shot you see is of a chicken running away from this notorious gangster, and it, it barely makes it out, and the chicken is meant to, I believe, represent our main character, Rocket, who throughout this film must find a way out before the walls completely close in on him. So before I begin, I've included timestamps. So if you want to see how I've divided my review, you can just look in the description box and skip around as you wish. The film opens up by introducing us to the tender trio and the origins of the City of God. So briefly, the City of God was founded in the 60s and the purpose being to remove the homeless from the center of Rio de Janeiro and sort of banish them on the outskirts of town, right? So they didn't really want the poor and the homeless kind of crowding up their picturesque, you know, city. And so they had to do away with them. So this kind of ghetto was artificially created to house the homeless and you know, push them away from the center. So the film opens up and introduces us to the city of God and the tender trio. So the trio consists of Shaggy, who's Benny's brother, Goose, who's Rocket's brother, and Clipper. So this last guy, Clipper, you know, he, he, he definitely learned his lesson. And this trio includes a plus one, Little Dice, who later will be renamed as Little Z, who becomes the king of the city of God, right? He just becomes this giant kingpin. Initially, the Tender Trio, like their purpose is to kind of show us how and why things may have manifested in the way that they have. So in the beginning, they were doing small crimes, robberies, nothing violent, right? And there's this tension between what you want to do and what you're actually able to do. And I really like the contrast between Little Dice and Little Z because they have this plus one in the group and this plus one I feel represents the sort of underbelly of violence that eventually comes out, right? Because not only are they being punished for being poor, because again, you're kind of segregated in this part of town, but this correlation between poverty and violence at the beginning, when City of God was just beginning, the correlation wasn't entirely fixed, but by the end of the film, it's, it's, it's like set in stone. I think the best representation of this sort of correlation between poverty and violence is this motel scene. So there's, this was the tipping point at the start of the film. So the tender trio get the brilliant idea to rob a brothel, which even at the beginning of the robbery, if you notice, you know, the people inside are telling them, hey, it's, y'all should be in school. And the whole thing is, is done lightheartedly or as lightheartedly as it could be. It's not violent, there's nothing wrong. And they take their plus one with them, little dice. 
And while they're robbing the Johns, they notice gunshots and they run. And later we discover that it's this kid, Little Dice, who would later become this kingpin that ends up killing everyone in the brothel. And this murder has some long lasting impacts. And I think it, it also speaks to this, this violence, right? Like you can't expect to house people, you know, punish people for being poor, sort of separate them from the center of the city, right? Like all the opportunities, everything you need to become wealthy or, you know, it's in the city and you've kind of stripped them of opportunity. And so this violence that's kind of, you know, bubbling beneath the surface is very well portrayed by the evolution of Little Dice to Little Z, I believe. And so because of the murder, these kids are on the run. Not only are they on the run, but you see how the city of God, like the police presence increases, but also just the police's sort of behavior towards the people, right? Like the police are more violent. They don't really see the residents or the people living in the city of God as like human beings. Right? They're kind of shooting freely, they're arresting whoever they want, because they're, as far as they're concerned, like, they're not people. Anybody who lives here is no longer, has been completely stripped of their humanity. And life after the motel shooting, you get to see how this correlation, like the movie does a beautiful job of showing how poverty and violence, like this correlation, just, you know, like the stigma of it and how it kind of paralyzes societies. And so one by one, the boys go their separate ways. So out of the tender trio, the one named Clipper, he leaves, he gets lucky. And there's a scene where he's walking and the police kind of shout and he just keeps walking. And I learned something from that scene. If you're, if you're guilty, keep walking, you know? And again, the police are kind of in this any means necessary. They want to find who these hot, they want to find where these boys are and they want to kill them, right? Like they, they want them dead to rights. So that's Clipper. Goose, the story of Goose is interesting because again, everything in this movie weaves in together beautifully. So Goose is Rocket's brother, Rocket being our main character. And Goose's demise starts when he has an affair with this woman in town. And after the affair is discovered, the husband ends up killing the wife and he ends up burying her alive. But what's interesting about the story is that when the press get a hold of it, they kind of sensationalize it, right? Like man buries wife alive, you know, like look at what happens in these parts, look at what they're capable of. And this is the first glimpse we get into the press and how the press kind of use places like the city of God to build viewers, to build subscribership. And this will be really important towards the end of the film. Anyways, this character Goose, as we know, he runs for his life and he's eventually killed by Little Dice. You know, he's, he's killed by him and that ends his story. And finally Shaggy. So Shaggy's death was the end of an era. So he was hiding out with his girlfriend or woman that he really, you know, had a strong attraction to. And just before they could escape, he ends up sh shot. He ends up shot to death. And the interesting thing about Shaggy is he was really offended by the fact that everyone in town thought that they were killers. You know, he was so convinced that it was the police that set them up. Like he couldn't imagine that, you know, anybody in his crew would be capable of murder. But little does he know it was their plus one that ended up killing all these people. And Shaggy's death sort of marks the beginning for our main character, Rocket. Because when Shaggy dies, this is the first time Rocket is seeing a camera. And he doesn't know what it is, but he feels like this camera is his way out. Because again, there's this tension between what you want to do and what you can do. And Rocket, he says from the beginning, he doesn't want to be a fisherman. He doesn't know what he wants to be, but it, it's, it's out. And so something about this camera kind of indicates to him, like, I can get out. And again, like the fine, the documentary sort of, nature of this film like the way they shoot this film it's almost like you're watching people in real life that's why you have to watch it a few times because like again the way they weave everything together you know how every end is a new beginning i think is just like spectacular his death enables us to fast forward to the era of little z and benny 
And this whole portion was fantastic, right? So the first thing you have to notice as we fast forward is the city of God itself. It goes from being this kind of desert nothingness to this urban hell, you know, it just like the way it's kind of transitioned. And actually that was totally lost on me the first time, you know, so the city of God literally like you, it kind of shows the origins and now we're in this like urban, nothing has gotten better. Things have gotten significantly worse. I mean, it really emphasizes the point that this was a part of town that was created to house people that the society didn't think was worthy of having any opportunities whatsoever. There's a line at the start. So we're introduced to Rocket and his friends and they're going, they're going to the beach. And before he goes to the beach, Rocket says something. The sun is for everyone, but the beach is for those who deserve it. And again, it speaks to like getting out, right? Because when you live in these conditions, you have like these moments where things are great and there are these opportunities and you feel like, you know, you have what you need, but it's temporary. And Rocket does not want a temporary solution, right? He wants the beach. He wants long-term, he wants to get out long-term, right? He doesn't want to rely on these moments where he's hanging out with his friends and things are okay. Like he needs out. And I really like this metaphor of the sun is for everyone, but the beach is for those who deserve it, right? Like, it, it kind of speaks to the struggle. And I want to talk about the contrast between Rocket and Little Z, because Rocket for me represents the average person living in these types of circumstances with people like Little Z. So Little Z is always on Rocket's radar, right? Like, he's, Rocket is always aware of Little Z's presence. He's always aware of where he is, you know, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that he killed his brother, but also of the fact that this man has a reputation for killing people on sight. Whereas Rocket is never on Little Z's radar, right? Time and time again, Little Z forgets his name. It's not until the end of the movie that he remembers Rocket's name, but for the most part, he doesn't really see him, right? And I think when you're living in these conditions, I think it's meant to emphasize like for people like Rocket, who are just trying to make it out and do the best they can with the awareness that they have. People like Little Z, it, it's very hard to avoid them, right? Because they're kind of the thing standing in your way, right? So for Rocket, Little Z has a huge presence, right? Like he represents violence, he represents, you know, like all the stigma that's attached to him and, you know, he, he can't really ignore him. Whereas Little Z doesn't care because he pretty much owns the town, right? He's kind of resorted to violence. He's resorted to crime. So for him, the average person is not his business, right? Like he's not there to make anybody comfortable but himself. I think the best scene that demonstrates that is this apartment scene. So there's a scene like basically documenting the disintegration of this apartment as little Z comes to power. And this apartment scene is also, I think it was meant to be kind of a brief history of organized crime in the city of God. So little Z and Benny, they're kind of best friends and they've kind of reached their limit when it comes to robberies, you know, and they decide, okay, we need to get into the drug trade if we're going to make some real money, you know, if we're going to be comfortable. And so they start taking over, they start taking over. And because organized crime did not exist at this time, it, the drug dealers were kind of their own independent body. So it didn't take long for him to take over. And with the exception of one drug dealer who was protected by Benny, little Z was able to take over. The last of which being this apartment. And the story of this apartment is, it says a lot, you know, the fact that this apartment was better in the past than it is in the present. So this apartment was originally owned by this woman who was selling drugs to, I guess, help her daughters. And eventually the apartment is taken from her and then the apartment is taken from them. So it just kind of goes through the number of people who stayed in the apartment. But if you watch the scene, like the apartment keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse but in, in, until it becomes a literal like hellhole. And by that time, little Z comes into the apartment and he's like, this is my, this is mine now. You know, you all work for me. And this apartment scene is the first time our protagonist and antagonist are seeing each other. And, you know, Rocket is an interesting character because he was there to buy weed for this girl that he likes. 
And there was a moment where he, he looks at a gun and he's like, you know what, I can avenge my brother's death, but he, he, he decides against it, right? He walks away. And little Z, despite the knowledge that Rocket is, you know, Goose's brother, the man he killed, he, he lets him go because he doesn't really occupy any space in his mind, right? Like, if you watch that scene, he's wearing his uniform. You know, there's, there's no threat. There's no threat to him at all. And so this would be one of many encounters between the two characters until Little Z's death. So Little Z taking over the drug trade, it kind of marks the beginning of a new era. And again, I love how they divided this movie. So Little Z and Benny, they kind of introduce what looks like law and order. They have this like good cop, bad cop relationship. And there are no sh shootouts. It's safe, you know, like be drug addicts can come in and buy their drugs. And it's not until Benny gets a girlfriend that things get a bit messy. And what I really enjoy is like, the, the movie does a good job of showing you and not telling you things because the, the cyclical nature of violence here is due to tunnel vision, right? So Benny and little Z, they're on top of the world, right? They went from having to watch their backs to having other people ne needing to watch their backs against. They, they, they are now the threat and therefore they don't see anybody around them, right? They, they see nothing but themselves. And a good example of that is Benny. So Benny, you know, he's feeling himself, you know, he, he really like, He's, he, he wants to be popular. He cares very much what people think of him. And that's probably why they make a good partnership because opposites attract. And when Benny first meets Angelica, so this woman who ends up tearing him apart from little Z, he totally doesn't see Rocket. You know, he totally ignores his presence. The only reason Benny really notices Rocket is because Angelica, you know, refers back to him. But it's just, I think, to emphasize how invisible Rocket is and people like Rocket, right? Like, this, they're not playboys, they're not drug dealers, they don't have any money, they're just average people. So they don't really have any space or they don't really notice anything about people. And then there's another scene with Tiago. So Benny, out of the two, is the partner that cares a lot what people think. And he kind of befriends Tiago, who's this a drug addict. He's addicted to cocaine. And there's a scene where they're racing their bicycles and he let him win. So if you watch that scene, Tiago is like, this kid is like pulling the brakes and Benny totally doesn't notice, right? Benny thinks he won. And next thing you know, he has a personal shopper. But again, it's just to like a very nice way. Like the, the third time I watched it, I realized, oh wow, like he really doesn't see himself, right? Like. Because when you're Benny and you're Little Z, the whole world kind of caters to you, right? Like Rocket becomes invisible, he has to back off. Like he likes this girl, but he, he, he can't. He, this guy has more power than him, he has to cater. This, this red-headed drug addict, Tiago, this Tiago, he, you know, he, need, he needs to be careful, right? Like, so again, it's just funny seeing the contrast in terms of like how everybody tiptoes around them. Meanwhile, these guys, Little Z and Benny, they have no idea that everybody's tiptoeing around them, right? They just assume people are falling in line or, you know, they, they don't see it. And this tunnel vision is probably the same reason that Little Z gives the runts the gun. So towards the end of the, the film, Little Z ends up being killed by these kids, this group of kids that they dubbed the runts. And it's very peculiar because it, 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 it just, it, it shouldn't have happened. And again, the reason it happened is because little Z just, they don't see themselves, right? And because they don't see themselves, they don't see their vulnerabilities and other people take advantage of their vulnerabilities. So it becomes a cycle of violence, right? People get to their highest point and then they fly too close to the sun and then they get shot down and then the same thing keeps happening again and again and again. And you can kind of see the evolution of this with little Z, his relationship to Carrot, and again, these kids, these runts. So little Z, unlike Benny, he has this obsession with becoming like the most powerful, you know, drug lord in this, like he just wants power. He wants to take over. And there's one guy in the neighborhood that's just kind of preventing him from doing that. 
And so he time and time again tries to convince his best friend, like, we need to kill this guy, we need to take his stuff, we need to take over, you know? And his friend is like, listen, you need to chill, you know? And little Z, like, he tries. And one of his key arguments are, are these runts, these runts who, you know, they're kind of this group of kids that go around raiding things, stealing things. Like, they're, they're just kind of wreaking havoc but not enough havoc to be killing this other drug dealer. And little Z's sort of obsession with his own power, like it, it's funny how it erases everything of the past, right? Because after all this tension with the runs, it actually escalates to a point where we get to probably one of the most tense scenes in this whole movie. So little Z is up to here, he's tired, and he kind of corners these kids and he initiates one of his soldiers to shoot one of the kids. And this is a very, very sad scene for a lot of reasons because little Z is very manipulative. So in order for him to have power, he kind of recruits kids in the neighborhood. And again, everything in the movie is there for a reason. And the kid who ends up killing another kid, you know, you see him earlier in the film, like he is wearing his school uniform. So he goes from wearing his school uniform to you know wearing regular clothes and then you know you can see the disintegration of this kid if you're kind of looking out for it and so little z is tired and so he recruits he kind of initiates this kid and forces you know this kid to shoot this other kid but what i think is really interesting about this is little z by the end of the film he has almost no memory of this event because fast forward he ends up giving these kids who he was trying to hunt down guns, right? And it's these guns that end up killing him. So again, it speaks to this like tunnel vision and how it's the hierarchy, right? In this neighborhood where you have these criminals who everybody's tiptoeing around, but they don't see it, right? Like they just see themselves and they just want more and more and more. And then eventually it's not enough, right? The violence just becomes too much. And just after this scene, like this is this is I mean talk about like weaving everything in together just after the scene there's um there's a part where you can see Benny making out with his girlfriend Angelica and little Z looking at a girl you know he's kind of eyeing this girl and I didn't notice this the first time I watched the film the second time I noticed it because when, when we get to Benny's farewell I thought the girl was random like I thought the girl that little Z goes up to, was it just some random girl he asked to dance? When in fact, the girl was not random. He had been eyeing this girl before. And not only had he been eyeing this girl before, but this girl's boyfriend was, you know, a character that we were introduced to early on. Like, close to the start of the film, somebody bumps into him and he ends up like pushing him. And little do we know that's knockout Ned. So the guy that would be little Z's arch nemesis is weaved into the story long before we're even introduced to him, you know? And this lead up to Benny's death, you know, the, this is like, we could break this down in many ways. I think the, the main thing that caused this was the, the shift in priorities, right? So Benny's priorities become himself, you know, he wants to get out, he wants to go with his girlfriend, have a farm, they want to become hippies, they want to have love. Little Z wants to become the most powerful man in the city of God. And because they misunderstand each other, they miscalculate an individual that leads to Benny's death, right? So one of Little Z's drug dealers, Blackie, he ends up killing his girlfriend. And Little Z wants to kill him, but Benny stops him. And unfortunately for little Z, he doesn't see how far off Benny is. Like Benny is no longer mentally in the drug trade, right? He's not there, he's not with them at all. And so little Z, time and time again throughout the film, you can see that he's being checked by his friend, right? Like Benny is like the, the person that, that kind of checks him. But unfortunately, because Benny has been so, you know, in love and dealing with all this stuff, there, there are things that he's, he's blind to. And because of that, they make a mistake by not killing this guy. And then of course, he ends up killing Benny. Benny's death, I mean, what to say about it? So we get to this farewell party and this farewell party is brilliant, right? It's, 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 it's fantastic, you know, because this club scene, the way it's shot, 
the different groups of people that they were able to kind of bring together and mesh together. And the beginning of the end happens, as I said, when little Z gets rejected. So little Z is feeling bad. He's thinking maybe I need a girlfriend, but sadly the girl that he wants doesn't want him. And so he starts wreaking havoc on her man who would later be knockout Ned, but he starts really wreaking havoc. And when that's not enough, he starts fighting with his friend. And the reason he starts fighting with Benny is that he notices a camera and that he was gifting a camera to Rocket, you know. And Rocket, you know, prior to the scene, like he was really, really going through it. You know, he's not doing that well. He took a job at a grocery store and he gets fired, you know, because he's kind of associated with these hoodlums that robbed the store. And then there's a robbery scene, you know. And I, th I think it's interesting because as a viewer watching this film, you know, you can see that if there's a good guy or a bad guy, you can see that little Z is the bad guy and Rocket is the good guy. However, this movie does a brilliant job of playing with you in terms of like how you see yourself. So you see that he's fired from the grocery store and then immediately after him and his friend think, okay, we need some quick cash and we need to rob some people. But of course they don't have the heart to rob anyone. Like they're not robbers, they're not criminals, they're not anything. However, there is one scene in their last attempt to commit a crime. A man pulls up and he asks for directions. They get in the car and the way the scene is shot, shortly after the boys get in the car, a body is being discovered. They kind of cut away to a scene of a body being discovered. And I would be lying if I said I didn't think Rocket and his friend killed that man. And I think a lot of people thought that in that scene. And I think it's to kind of play on our emotions where you think, maybe I'm reading into this too much, but you know, this, this stigma that's attached to people who come from poor neighborhoods, especially a place like the city of God, where, you know, you don't, you, you don't differentiate between any of them. You know, at, at this point, Rocket and his friend have done nothing to suggest that they're killers or they could be killers. However, for a brief second, I was 100% sure they killed this man. And again, it's just funny how we're quick to jump to conclusions when it comes from people that live in these neighborhoods. So Rocket is unable to get the money he needs to buy a camera. He comes to the party. He has no girlfriend. Benny stole his girlfriend. And so he's in a tough spot until, you know, at the party, Benny was about to gift him with this camera. But who comes along and ruins it? Little Z. Little Z takes the camera away. You know, he pushes him down and they end up fighting. And of course, Blackie, this, this guy, this drug dealer they didn't kill, ends up killing Benny. But what's important to note is the, the parallels between Benny's death and Shaggy. So when Benny dies, it, it's the end of an era. I think it's interesting how Benny's death, again, you have Benny and you have this camera, right? And still, you know, like from Shaggy's death to Benny's death, still Rocket is unable to get that camera, right? Like he, he, he's getting closer and closer to his dreams, but he's unable to touch it. And so Benny's death pretty much marks the beginning of the end. And it also triggers to Rocket, like, I gotta get out of here. You know, like I, I, gotta, I gotta keep it moving. And so as soon as Benny dies, it's, you know, Little Z's final countdown and the rise of Knockout Ned. And Knockout Ned has to be one of the best characters I've ever seen. I mean, the actor who plays him is fantastic. And I, I do want to say that, that, like, the actors in this film, you know, they, especially Little Z, like, he really deserved an Oscar or something. But, you know, the way this movie is shot, like, you, you feel like no one is acting, which speaks to how great they are, you know. And I, I wonder, like, with foreign films, if people register that, you know, these are stories being told. You know, this is an actor. He gave a hell of a performance. These are not people who, you know, this isn't a documentary. This is very, very, very fantastic storytelling. The little Z totally loses it, you know, and it just, it becomes insane. And it gets to a point where he ends up assaulting this girl that he has a crush on. And he assaults her with this amulet on. So before he became little Z, he kind of went to this witch doctor who gave him an amulet and said, listen, you are little Z, I'm giving you this amulet. However, if you have intercourse with this amulet on, you will die. And I thought that was great foreshadowing in terms of what would happen to little Z. So there's that and also the fact that little Z starts to break his own rules. And again, 
there was some order to the chaos prior, but now, you know, when you compare the start of the film to after Benny's death, like the violence that has always kind of been checked, you know, at first by Benny, you know, he was that check, right? Like he was kind of checking the violence, but now the violence is un unleashed. Like there's nothing to check the violence. And so the absurdity of everything just kind of comes out. So now the violence that was kind of, you know, there is, is, is full blown. The only thing that saves not Cow Ned is the fact that after assaulting his girlfriend, little Z for some reason decides not to kill him and then remembers that he should kill him. He goes back, but unfortunately by the time he's able to get there, things don't go as planned. And this, this whole like situation, so knockout Ned's sort of misery leaves, leads to sort of Carrot's fortune. So one of the few drug dealers that Little Z isn't able to kill is Carrot. And the reason he can't kill him it was because of Benny, but he's dead. So now an all out sort of war begins. But knockout Ned's character, even before this whole hellish situation starts, really speaks to the fact that no one gets out clean, you know? And his motivations are revenge, right? So Knockout Ned were introduced to him as a bus driver. The brief sort of information that we get about him is that he was the best marksman in his battalion, in the military, but he couldn't really get a good job. And they literally awakened a sleeping giant. I mean, when we find out how good this guy is at shooting people and fighting back, it's kind of a wonder that he was able to keep it bottled in for so long, because again, Knockout Ned is a character we were introduced to like at the very beginning. And he kept getting messed with like time and time again, he kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed and it kind of speaks to that violence, right? Like it's like, okay, he, he kind of held it in as long as he could until he couldn't, right? So you literally awakened a sleeping giant and you know, they kind of pair together, but there's a scene where Knockout Ned is shooting, you know, like he, he ends up hitting a few guys and little Z is so angry, right? He gets shot and he ends up shooting his friend. He just ends up shooting him. And again, it just speaks to his unraveling, right? Like he's shooting his friend on sight for talking too much. Like there's nothing to check him. There's really nothing to check anyone, right? It's to the point where um, this movie really shows that revenge is a, is a dish best not served like at all. You know, it doesn't really lead anywhere. It doesn't lead, if your motivation is revenge, like nothing good will come out of it. This war kind of triggers, again, Rocket to get out and he wants to become a journalist. And his goal in becoming a journalist is to try and get a camera. And then there's this issue of the press because Rocket is is interesting character because the press, you know, they really, they cover places like the City of God for viewership, right? Because people like to hear about gruesome crime. They like to hear about places that they're not from like they you know they like to hear these horror stories and so for the press places like city of god are like you know material gold right and rocket has that dilemma where the place he's trying to escape is exactly what he needs like he, he's kind of in that situation where the only way he can get out is by staying in right because he has access to this place that not a lot of people have access to and sadly the reason people want that access isn't to draw attention to, you know, how horrible the situation is or how marginalized these people are. It's more to have the access so the press can make money off these stories that people read. We'll come back to the issue of the press, but this war goes on for one year between Little Z and Knockout Ned. And it goes on for so long that people actually forget what the war is about. Like nobody knows what this war is about anymore. And the whole thing just becomes about killing and taking over, killing and taking over, right? Like it, it's so ego and self-motivated. Like there's no long-term plan. Everything is like so right here, right now. And also the cost of the war. So little Z at this point is obsessed with revenge. And so he ends up buying a bunch of guns that he can't afford. You know, he ends up stocking up and stocking up, but he can't afford them. You know, he, he's kind of, he's, he's biting off more than he can chew. Whereas on the flip side, Knockout Ned and Carrot are paying for their guns, but they're robbing people. And this is also a tricky situation because what started off as a beef between two people ends up killing a lot of innocent people, right? Because you can't really rob all these places. 
and not kill innocent people. So it speaks to intention, you know, like these kind of gray areas. Because although knockout net did not mean to harm innocent lives, innocent lives were harmed in the process. So you would think fortunately for little Z, knockout Ned eventually gets shot and he's sent to jail. But unfortunately, knockout Ned going to jail attracted attention of the press who wants to know more about this war in the ghetto, right? They want to know what's going on in the city of God. And because knockout Ned is super handsome, you know, he made for good front page news. Whereas little Z is not that handsome and he becomes obsessed, right? Little Z's, he went from being obsessed to becoming the kingpin to just killing everyone. And again, little Z is one of those characters where he's just violent, right? Like there's no motivation. His, his violence was checked, but inherently he's a violent person. So he, he ends up becoming obsessed with like the press and looking for pictures and all this stuff. And you know, like he, he wants his face in the papers and there's no logic anymore. Like the absurdity of it, like even just the, the self-preservation goes away, right? Because here you have an area of town that's already over-policed. And at this point, he doesn't care, right? He just wants his name in the paper. And so a picture is indeed worth a thousand words. And this is when Rocket comes in. And so they find the camera and they tell Rocket to come in. And Rocket, it's the opportunity of a lifetime because he gets to photograph one of the most notorious people and he gets a few photographs, right? He takes some fantastic pictures. And again, it speaks to that tension where it's like he needs to get out, but he needs to stay in in order to get out. The logic, again, so here you have a drug kingpin taking pictures with guns that he bought from the police. Like he's not thinking logically, right? Like anybody looking at these pictures are gonna wonder, where did you get these guns? What's happening? What's, you know, and that's the thing about you know, the, the nuance of the movie, like it, it kind of it makes a commentary about like why violence, violence is enabled in these parts, right? Like it's not for nothing. These guns are being supplied by police and it does benefit someone to keep the violence going. And so by exposing himself, little Z unintentionally exposed everybody else around him. And unfortunately for Rocket, these pictures found their way to a reporter and he ends up getting what he wants, which is being on the front page of a newspaper. But unfortunately, like, he's terrified. And there's a scene where Rocket is, you know, yelling at this journalist. She's, she's really angry with her. And then we cut away to little Z laughing, you know, he sees this picture in the paper. He's like, we need to bring that kid back. And it's not until Rocket makes little Z famous that little Z decides, I'm going to remember your name. You know, this is like, now he'll never forget the name Rocket. Prior to that, he was just anybody. After this, he'll never forget him. So all this uh, fuss about the press, you know, it's a distraction. Like little Z is so distracted that he totally misses that Knockout Ned was freed from prison. So Knockout Ned is able to get out because carrots literally, I mean, it's suggested in the scene that they pay the nurse to distract the guard so they can kind of, you know, have him out. And shortly after, we come full circle, right? So the movie goes all the way around to explain that first scene, you know? So now we understand the standoff. So we get to the standoff scene where little Z is chasing a chicken to kill it, you know, senseless, the absurdity of it. And now we understand why the police are there. So at the beginning of the film, you see little Z and his gang, you see Rocket and his friend in the middle, and then you see the police in the back. And then you realize why the police are there. So the police are there to collect their money from little Z, right? They want their money. They want to know, they, you know, they've been exposed and it seems like little Z hasn't been paying up, right? They've been supplying guns, but he hasn't been really delivering. And this turns out, this turns into like all out violence when knockout Ned comes out of nowhere and starts shooting everybody. And this whole shootout scene, I mean, Rocket, he is taking pictures like his life depends on it. Like if you watch this scene, like he is snapping and snapping. Like he knows that it's now or never, you know, he knows it's now or never. And I think one of the most complicated sort of moments is when Knockout Ned dies. So during the war, Knockout Ned is shot by this kid. And we realize that the kid who ends up killing him, you know, Knockout Ned killed his father. And both the kid and Knockout Ned die. And both of them had the same motivation, right? Revenge. So in one of the robberies, Knockout Ned kills a security guard. Turns out that security guard, you know, his son was there. 
and the son witnessed the whole thing. And so the son wants revenge. And so this, again, this violence that leads to just, it just combusts, right? It becomes a cycle. This kid wanted revenge, he kills Knockout Ned. And in the process, he ends up dying because you know, no, you can't come out alive in these situations. So I, I like that commentary, how they both kind of died and they both had the same motivation. Because initially when I watched that scene, I was very frustrated because I was like, not not cotton it, like, no. But then I, I thought about it, I'm like, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. So Knockout Ned is dead and Little Z is broke and vulnerable. And this scene of Little Z trying to rally the runts to kind of get his position back was really perplexing because you can see that Little Z is totally in his own world. He thinks he's more important than he is. And karma is a, because these kids end up just shooting him straight. And this, the way the, the movie manipulates you into thinking one thing's gonna happen when something else happens. Because at first I thought the police were gonna kill him, but the police don't kill him. It's actually these kids that kill him. And I thought that was poetic justice because, you know, not that long ago, little Z was shooting one of their members in the foot, right? And now he's shot, you know, he's kind of dead in the ground, but the whole time Rocket is taking pictures. And, you know, there's a moment where Rocket kind of approaches Little Z's body and he takes a close up and he knows that this is the shot that's going to make him famous. Not the police, none of this, but this, this bloody shot of this dead gangster, like that's going to sell papers. You know, this is, this is the thing that he needs. And so this photo is his escape plan. And I thought it was interesting that at the end of the film, he doesn't publish or it's a, it's sort of suggested that he doesn't publish the photos with the police and it, he, it's the photo the, of little Z kind of bleeding out that ends up getting on the front page. And again, it's, it's that negotiation, right? Because sadly for, sadly for Rocket, he's in, a, he's in an interesting dilemma because the only way he can get out is to give the press what they want, right? He has to play the game. And the press, they're not interested in the history of the city of God. They're not really interested in why places like this exist, for what purpose. Again, like the inhabitants of the city of God, they're so removed from the center on purpose in order to strip them of that, of opportunity, in order to kind of, you know, they're, they're outcasts, right? And so, and they're over-policed. So, but the press doesn't really care about that. They just care about stories and selling papers. So in the end, Rocket had to do what was best to get out. Like it was a survival situation. Like if I, if you print, because there's this whole theme throughout the movie of kill or be killed, right? Like the big fish getting the smaller fish. Like you have to decide and publishing pictures with the police, like that's a kill or be killed situation. However, a dead gangster, you know, that benefits everyone, you know, it keeps him off their radar and it gets him employed. So he ends up getting an internship and he ends up making his way out of that place. And the runts end up, you know, taking over for better or for worse. And that's how the film ends. So overall, you know, it's a brilliant movie. And I want to speak about this movie 10 years later. You know, this film aged well. However, the implications are are, are interesting because there's a documentary on Netflix, you know, City of God 10 years later, and it discusses, it discusses a lot of things. It, it takes us like where the actors are now. A lot of the actors, you know, they're, they're doing okay. You know, they weren't really able to replicate the success of the City of God. Like they weren't really able to find their footing. A lot of it has to do with the fact that they didn't know the movie would be as successful as it was. You know, so they didn't end up taking the box office. Like they ended up just getting paid a stipend and then using the stipend. But this film, you know, in terms of foreign films and like legitimacy, because this is the first film that I've watched where I didn't even notice the subtitles. You know, again, it's like you're, you're, you're peering in. And I thought about this commentary on the press because, you know, the press is obsessed in this film with sensationalizing the news and, you know, what's going on in the city of God? Like, you know, because viewers, they want to see this. And so a movie like this has a dilemma because it's, you have a part, it's loosely based on a true story. It's set in a real place. So it's not a, it's not a part, it's not something we see often. These are not stories that are told often, right? So for viewers, it's, it's fantastic and it's entertaining because it's so outside of our world. But for the people who live there, you know, 
it's it's probably not that fantastic, right? And you know, there's this issue of representation because a lot of these actors were saying like they weren't able to get work after, they weren't able to do anything after. Like they were able to get work, but it was either they were typecast or and again, that's quite frustrating because they give some of the best performances ever and how you can kind of look at someone like Little Z and say he can't play anything is shocking, you know? And again, it, it's, it, there's like a, a deep-seated sort of stigma and racism that exists in the society that prevents you from ever finding true success, you know? And the, the actors did talk about it in the film where like, um, for example, the actress who played um, Shaggy's girlfriend, you know, she made a point like you don't see black people on TV that much like hosting or doing things like this and there's a reason for that. So although at face value this film, you know, should have done a lot for, you know, just in terms of progressing representation and it, it didn't do much, you know, it, 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 it aged well, you know, from the outside looking in. You know, it's a fantastic film, but the effects of the film in terms of actually changing things or... And so, yeah, you guys let me know what you think. There's a lot to say about this. I hope you enjoyed this commentary. It wasn't really a breakdown, but again, the way the film is shot, the characters, the amount of love that went into it, there, it's, it's, it's just like jaw-dropping. Anyways, you guys let me know what you think and until next time.